Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. Stephen Hawking is known for any number of revolutionary advances in theoretical physics. The singularity theorems that he did with Roger Penrose and others in the late 60s, the evaporation and radiation from black holes in the mid-70s, and in the early 80s with Jim Hartle, he calculated the wave function of the universe to try to explain the creation of the universe from nothing. But in 1988, Hawking revolutionized not theoretical physics, but the scientific publishing industry with the appearance of A Brief History of Time, his surprise runaway bestseller. I was a little bit too young to take advantage of this, but I'm told that in the late 80s, after A Brief History of Time came out, if you were a theoretical physicist with a book to write, you could get a million dollar advance, no problem. Not like that anymore, but that was those were the days. Andre Linde is a well-known cosmologist whose name will appear again in this episode. He's also a mischievous guy, and he likes to tell the story. Back in the late 80s, he would be riding an airplane, sitting next to someone who was reading A Brief History of Time, and Linde would inevitably say, you know, I like the book, but I didn't really understand it. And the person reading it would go, oh, yeah, it's really not that hard. You just have to really concentrate while you're reading it. But... Hawking never gave up doing science. You know, he wrote more books, but he also wrote a lot of technical papers in the published research literature. And his views continued to evolve about how to do quantum cosmology, how to think about the nature of the quantum universe. Today's guest, Thomas Hertog, was one of Hawking's most frequent collaborators in those years. He was a PhD student with Hawking and then continued to write papers with him and has now come out with his own book called On the Origin of Time, Stephen Hawking's Final Theory. And it's fact that it's a joint theory that he's describing between himself and Stephen. So we'll talk about that theory, but we'll talk about the genesis, the evolution of what we mean by quantum cosmology, how we go about saying, okay, you have the whole universe, we're going to apply the rules of quantum mechanics to this universe. And I, I think you will correctly get the impression that there's a lot that we know about how to do that and a lot that we don't know. So our views on how best to do it are continually evolving. And it brings in both philosophical ideas about the role of the orig- of the observer in defining what you mean by a universe and calculating the probability of the universe looking different ways, but also very modern cutting-edge physics ideas like holography and the emergence of time from the quantum wave function. So uh, as I apologize to Tomas in the middle of the podcast, you know, this is a tough one for me, not because I don't understand it, but because I'm too close to the issues here. I think about these issues all the time, and so it's harder for me to put myself in the seat of the audience member who is not a super expert. I hope that I didn't interject my own views or interpretations too much here. I I tried to reel myself in, but I don't think I was very successful. I think that you'll find my own views all over the place. So hopefully Thomas's views uh, shine through because he he has a different point of view that is a very interesting message. I think it's, it's worth taking very seriously, especially because we don't know the final answers. We're still working on this. We're still moving forward. So let's go. Thomas Ertog, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Hey, hi, Joan. You know, normally, and I'm, I'm sure it will happen in this episode also, uh, here at the Mindscape podcast, we focus like a laser beam on the substantive intellectual content, and we don't dig that much into the personal fun stories of of people's histories and so forth. But in your case, uh, you are Stephen Hawking's most frequent collaborator in the last years of of his life, and that collaboration forms a lot of the basis of what you're going to tell us about in the podcast and in the book that you've written. Uh, how does one become Stephen Hawking's collaborator? I'm sure that there's a story there. Yeah, but it's 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 a typical science story, right? Um, there was a folklore. There was there was sort of a lore at uh, a well known sort of story at the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics in Cambridge, which was uh, whoever got top scores uh, in their famous Part Three course would get an invitation to go talk to Stephen. 
And so that's essentially what happened and what happened to many other students in different years. Um, so that's how I first entered into his office. Uh, the real surprise, of course, was the experience of that first conversation, mm. which was anything but normal. <laughs> um, it was not normal because it was interspersed with various uh, journalists walking in and out. And the second thing which I thought was uh, very exceptional was that Stephen went just straight in mm. and started talking about um, how he found that whole idea of the multiverse so paradoxical and how his colleague Andre Linde had these outrageous theories. And so there, there I was. How could I possibly have an opinion on the multiverse and Andre Linde uh, <laughs> as a 22-year-old student? <laughs> But that was fun. That was really fun. And, you know, again, we're not going to spend most of the time talking about this stuff, but how did it work, your collaboration? I mean, again, later in life, Stephen had a tougher and tougher time uh, yeah. banging out yeah. the sentences, right? Right, 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 right. Yes, yes. I think I was, I was lucky, in a sense, for two reasons. Um, the timing, late 90s, so Stephen and I met 98, really, um, yeah, I think it was really a coincidence why it worked so well. First of all, on, on your point in terms of communication, uh, so Stephen was already using his computer voice at the time, but the whole system worked really well. Right. He had this sort of, uh, he, he was used to using a mouse to select words and, 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 and he sort of, my impression was that by then he sort of instinctively knew when to click to select certain words. And so the whole system was working very well in the late 90s. So, and of course, I had a notion of time. Um, so we would sit hours and hours in that department, shoulder to shoulder, and he would type out sentence and sentence and by, 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 okay. If you spend so much time by at some point you you begin to understand <laughs> what he's talking about and, yeah. and 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 you get going so that was that was important because those years really were a foundation for when it became very difficult later on to communicate i think at that point these first few years we developed some sort of intuition good uh common language the second point i think which was equally relevant is that the late 90s were a great time in cosmology Mm. Um, Stephen's famous book, A Brief History of Time, had been out for like a decade. Um, so the frenzy around that book had sort of died down. He was back to research, and he was back to research because cosmology was 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 was, was a, it was a golden era, right? Uh, you had these mystifying observations about the acceleration of the universe the CMB fluctuations, which were pointing to an early phase of acceleration, which we now call inflation. Uh, and then you had these paradoxes to do with the multiverse, which were essentially going to the core of cosmological theory. So this was a good time. Stephen was, Stephen was grounded in research again mm. um, and still being able to communicate. And that's what we built on, I would say. And in particular, the research that you did together, um, I, I think it's fair to say, always, as always, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, is sort of downstream from the wave function of the universe work that he did with Jim Hartle in the early 1980s. So quantum cosmology in some sense. So why don't you explain <laughs> to us what that is? What's what's about that? What is the wave function of the universe, Thomas? <laughs> okay. Good. Um, well, so in a way, the whole wave function thinking, the whole sort of idea of let's think about the universe in a quantum mechanical way uh, as a quantum system must have been sort of the moral lesson that Stephen took out of his PhD work, his own PhD work in the 1960s, when he essentially showed using Penrose's techniques that the Big Bang, uh, classically, the origin of the universe, the Big Bang in Einstein's theory is a singularity where, where, where Einstein's theory breaks down. It's the origin of time. Uh, is this going to be an Einstein's theory? If you would take it at face value, 
you'd almost be driven to the statement, okay, this is not science. This, mm. this lies outside science. But of course, there's another lesson, the one, the one Stephen and most of our colleagues took. Well, wait a minute, it's just quantum. The quantum nature of gravity becomes important. But then how do you go about doing something about that? Uh, that's when that's I think when when Jim and, and and Stephen's pioneering work came about. Well, if the universe is a quantum system, then it must have a quantum state somehow, a very abstract, a super abstract description of reality. Um, and the, the ingenuity of, of of Stephen's work, which which featured so much in a brief history of time, was that he came up with the first fairly explicit model of how you would go about giving a quantum description of the Big Bang of the creation of the universe. And their trick was really to sort of, in a way, bend the time dimension of Einstein's theory into a space dimension. And if your reality is pure space dimensions, you know what to do to close it. You can just round it off like, like a sphere. And so Stephen's famous line, of course, was, what is the Big Bang? It's a bit like the South Pole. And what was there before? Well, it's like asking what's south of the South Pole. It's a meaningless question. So that was, of course, the typical oracular uh, Hawkingian kind of <laughs> phrase, right? But by the late 90s, Stephen and many others had realized that the creation theory, so to speak, of brief history of time had a fundamental problem, which is that taken at face value, you'd be led to the conclusion that uh, the universe should be empty, that the universe should be, yeah, that there should be no stars, no galaxies, no life. And so while their original theory was beautiful in a way from a theoretical perspective, it's almost like you, and I think he's, I think he felt like that, that he, that he sort of had cracked the enigma of creation, so to speak, by by giving a mathematical description of how you can make a universe, it was very much, um, it was not the kind of universe we, we inhabit. Yeah. So there was something missing. Right. I actually, I, I do. That's going to be a heart and soul, I think, of this conversation because it's, a, it's really the, what your book builds up to. But I want to linger in the 80s for a little while uh, to get the setup okay. so that everyone comes in on the same page here. So. When we say the quantum state of a system, if it's an electron or something like that, something that we are very used to treating as a quantum mechanical object, it's a wave function for every position that we could measure it in. It tells us the probability, et cetera. So it's a, it's a function of every possible location we could measure it. What do you mean when you say the wave function of the universe is it is it supposed to be it sounds hard to write down a possible quantum amplitude for every particle in the universe right and it is worse than that if you treat if you, i mean what we really mean and certainly what stephen meant in the 80s by a wave function of the universe is very much uh, a wave function not just of the of a particle describing various positions of a particle like an electron but really a sort of abstract description that describes a superposition of various possible universes, hmm. including all the matter and the space and time. So it's almost like you go from one universe to a zoo of possible universes. And so you really go up a level in abstraction and a level <laughs> and in confusion, right? Yeah. And frankly, I think... The question what we mean by a wave function may well be at the heart of of of, of these 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 more recent developments with Stephen and 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 and, and what, I, what what we worked on. Yeah, good. Because of course, if the wave function predicts an empty universe, if the empty universe is the by far the dominant wave crest, so to speak. Yeah, then you know something's missing, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, good. But this was this was Linde's complaint, right? Uh, Stephen would be saying, "Yeah, with your multiverse, you have infinitely many observers, and you don't know where we are." And then Linde would say, 
by your wave function has no observers that uh, <laughs> that's equally bad <laughs> maybe maybe that is even worse honestly <laughs> <laughs> yes yes i can i, I didn't want to say it <laughs> but okay i mean i, I want to give the listeners a feeling for how we uh operationally go about this. I mean, clearly, you're going to have to make some simplifications if you're going to think about the wave function of the universe. Yes, yes. One, what is, what, what is, the, what is, the, what is the goal here? It is really just like we do in ordinary physics problems. We try thought experiments. We try to simplify the situation. But of course, in such a way that you think or that you hope to capture the essence of the problem and um i my impression is that that this has worked pretty well in in this quantum cosmology program of course it is not an exact it is not an exact wave function it is not uh, a, a precise formulation but somehow and a little bit a little bit miraculously um the the general framework of quantum cosmology it seems to me has has been able to capture a few key foundational features of how we go about thinking about the quantum universe um which have been very difficult to discover by other means it obviously runs into the question that you know the person on the street has been told every day of their life that we don't understand quantum gravity. <laughs> so it sounds like you're doing quantum gravity even though we don't understand it. How do you get away with that? Yeah, so somehow we get away with that. Um, I think we understand some some I think we understand more than we sometimes admit. Good. I do think we understand, we have learned a lot about sort of the, the, the conceptual framework. Maybe we don't have a precise mathematical picture, but, and you can see where this, where, where this goes, right? Um, these, these, these toy models do capture certain essential features. The universe, the, 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 the fact that the universe inflates at early times, uh, and also, yeah, this, this idea that, well, as we all know from quantum mechanics, the act of observation plays a crucial role, mm. right? The, an electron doesn't really have a position as long as we don't ask for it. But that is a fundamental different thing from a classical system, which of course has a position and a momentum. So imagine now thinking about the universe as a wave function, as a description of all possible universes. Maybe it isn't quite real, until we bring in the observer. Mm. And so that has been a whole fruitful area, I think, to to study the kind of questions, to study ultimately the relation between our existence and, and, and the, the nature of the universe in, in, in a quantum mechanical setting, something which classically you cannot begin to ask really. Yet. So... I'm a bit more optimistic. We keep saying we don't understand quantum gravity, but I think we are we're still way along. <laughs> and, um, and, and and that's then and then we haven't even talked about holography. Right. We 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 will. Don't don't you worry. But I, I do <laughs> want. I'm okay. I, I do want to, uh, you know, again, give a flavor of some of the uh, of some of the issues that one faces here. You already mentioned. Uh, turning time into something that looks like space. I mean, this was infamously the part in A Brief History of Time where most people are like, okay, I give up, because he started talking about imaginary time. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you, you're welcome to say no, but could you explain what imaginary time is and why it mattered? Why do you had to do that? Like, time is real to you and me. Why do you have to make it imaginary? Ah, well... Well, yeah, okay. Time, time is real to you and me here. Eh? That's all, that's all fine. But as we discussed already, when we go back in the history of the universe to er the earliest stages, the Einsteinian way of thinking about the expanding universe, we run it backwards, and 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 time, time stops. So you could already have said in the sixties or even earlier, in fact, because the this this idea that time had an origin and that that was the Big Bang has been around for ninety years. So the discovery of the Big Bang to me, the fact that the Big Bang is the origin of time, already shows that 
there must be something emergent about time. If we're going to understand the Big Bang, we better don't put in time as a prior assumption mm. because it's all about how the dimension or perception of time as we know it and as we experience it comes about. So I would say that the dimension of time has been a problem all along in modern relativistic cosmology. And in that sense, um, Stephen Stephen's trick to sort of turn time into space is in a way exactly what the doctor ordered. <laughs> and of what course, you... it's a bit radical, but then the Big Bang is a very radical phenomenon, right? Um, yeah. And in fact, that was later, much later, we shouldn't probably go too deep into this, but now, uh, almost 40 years on really from Stephen's time, into, time goes into space business, now we understand that this is much, this is, yeah, now we understand how that trick, so to speak, mm -hmm. is much less uh, random as, as it looks, but in fact emerges from uh, our new holographic way of thinking about okay, the universe, good. much more as an, as, as an effective description. So, of course, this was Stevens, this was Stevens' bold sort of characteristic way of doing physics back, back in the days. Um, he had an intuition that he could do all of physics without time, essentially. Um, everything could be just spatial Euclidean uh, geometries. And I must say that since he died, that kind of physics, that kind of approach to quantum gravity, both in terms of black holes and, and in terms of the Big Bang, has, has gained, regained importance. Right. So, we did have a, a podcast episode with Netta Engelhart, uh, who was one of the people working on getting information out of black holes. And the idea of Euclidean quantum wormholes loomed large. <laughs> yeah. And so Hawke would have liked that, I think. <laughs> That's right. OK, good. But I'm still I'm still stuck in the 80s because, you know, look, I'm older than you. My formative years were uh, back in the 80s. And the big thing at that time, you already mentioned Andre Linde and, and, and Hawking had a little bit of a disagreement about the wave function of the universe. It grew into this disagreement about the multiverse, et cetera. But, but back in the day, it was just about inflation. And can we get inflation out of our theory of quantum cosmology? So right. why don't you explain to the listeners what inflation is and why it matters to us? Okay, yeah. Um, so inflation, indeed, came, came along in the early 80s. Um, somewhat independent, I think, of... Stevens' uh, quantum creation model um, as a way of more of inflation. What is inflation? Inflation is a very rapid phase of in, in expansion in the earliest stages of the universe's evolution, which creates a big universe in a fraction of a second. And so it sort of interconnects our entire observable universe and to me, the, the big bonus of inflation is that because it's such a rapid phase of expansion, it kind of, it, it sort of um, generates with it a pattern of fluctuations, a pattern of variations in the universe, um, purely from quantum uncertainty, essentially. There are particles that are being sort of uh, teared out of the vacuum and set you up with a big universe that is not exactly the same everywhere. It comes mm. with some sort of roughness, and that roughness is exactly what you need to, uh, over millions and millions of years, generate stars and galaxies and so forth. So inflation on its own, and that I mean, has been, well, I would say, there's significant observational support for such an early phase of rapid expansion because the roughness that you generate during inflation is reflected in the famous uh, cosmic microwave background images, which uh, show that the temperature wasn't equally distributed, but nearly equally distributed, right? Um, so inflation stands on its own, really. But the big question, of course, which must have been the question, I think, in the early 80s, but okay, how does, it, how does inflation start? And that's where all the disagreements came around. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think 
amazingly, that was not a question that most inflationary cosmologists <laughs> cared about. I mean, they just said, well, as long as it starts, it gets us what we want. But but Hawking and Linde and a few others like Alex Vilenkin were you know, a, a plucky minority who really tried to understand why it would start. And that was part of what the wave function of the universe was supposed to be about. Right. OK. OK. But of course, also since then, I think we've learned that uh, it is an important question how inflation started. Yeah. Because uh, the pattern of variations in, say, the cosmic microwave background radiation, the, the afterglow of the Big Bang, uh, is going to depend on precisely how inflation unfolded. So it's not that it, it, it's. It, it's not an empty question. I mean, the, the specific mechanism that drives inflation in the early universe leaves its observational traces. So if we want to predict the details, the fine details of, 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 uh, of those fossils, so to speak, we better understand how it started. Yeah, I agree with you. But, you know, again, plucky minority. I, th I think you're right that it's more common these days. And, and But there is, you know, a slight Maybe, I don't want to say downside, but implication of this that you already mentioned, which is that there are these quantum fluctuations that mean that inflation is a little bit rough. It doesn't end the same everywhere. And on very large scales, those fluctuations can be very big and give rise to a multiverse and you know different things going on in different places. And someone like Andre Linde embraced that multiverse and, and said, OK, there it is. That explains why... Our own universe is so unusual looking because it's a tiny, tiny part of some gigantic ensemble. My impression is that Stephen uh, and you did not embrace that picture quite as lovingly. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And right, right. I think this is this is exactly the moment where I where I entered Stephen's office so yeah. at the heart of that disagreement. Um, somehow I think... Andre, so the, the, the problem of uh, it, it's appealing in one sense, the multiverse, because it's a, suppose you would need to generate a huge expanding space uh, where different regions um, behave like different universes, even with different effective laws of physics. Yeah, then you generate some sort of gigantic reality in which the apparent biophilic design of our universe would be just a natural fluke and that's it yeah so it i think it appealed to to some cosmologists that this would get us around a lot of the perceived fine tuning um mm -hmm. issues that the, the idea of or the, the the observation uh that our universe is at the level of physics remarkably fit for life uh, of course, if there are a zillion universes out there, then once in a while you're going to have such a such a universe. But there was one problem from from and which was which was clear in the '90s already, which is okay. Suppose you have a multiverse, then if you want to turn this into a fully uh, a full fledged scientific hypothesis, you better tell me in which of these universes we should be, and therefore what we should observe what kind of roughness in the CMB we should observe or what kind of value for this or that parameter we should expect to observe. And so that's, that's something which we which cosmologists um, call the measure issue, uh, the measure problem. And the measure problem is really how should we, in a gigantic multiverse, um, associate what weight should we associate to different kinds of universes? How important are different kinds of universes in this gigantic reality? And so I think that was the crucial point. Somehow I think Stephen thought to that to 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 get a proper scientific falsifiable hypothesis out of the multiverse would would require a radical quantum thinking. Whereas I think other people like Linde thought, okay, the measure issue, it's eventually it's going to go away um, by some sort of anthropic principle or by another means. Um, and that's, of course, a very interesting debate because uh, 
this goes to the heart of what cosmological theory is about. Yeah. How do we fit into the grand scheme? Are we, is there a giant inflating space in which the anthropic principle is going to select our universe? Or is this giant inflating space not quite there without bringing in that observer's perspective in a more fundamental way interwoven with physical theory itself, with quantum, with quantum thinking? And you're going to be on the latter half. You bet. <laughs> well, let's let's linger lovingly over this distinction because I think it's an important one, but it's also a difficult one. Uh, cosmologists who do think about the universe, or for that matter, people who do black hole information or whatever, anyone who talks about quantum gravity, it seems to me is very tempted by still drawing a classical picture of space-time, even though they know they're talking about quantum gravity and saying, well, there are fluctuations of some sort. But I, I take it the point you're making, it seems from reading the book, I, I cheated by reading the book, um, yeah. that's not really fair. The, you know, to A truly quantum universe isn't just a big fluctuating classical universe. Is that fair? Right. I think that is indeed the key distinction, that you either assume that there is some sort of background out there which can be wildly fluctuating in different regions, but the sort of big, big background in which all this happening, in which all this is happening, acts as yeah, some sort of foundation. Whereas, but this took many years. Eh? Well, now, now I'm jumping around. I mean, Stephen in the late '90s didn't have this, didn't have the solution. Um, but eventually, as you as you suggest, we came to see that. This is still too classical. This is still too much of, um, yeah, it's not enough quantum. I can't say it differently. And so we started to try to go, try to try to try to take a fully quantum view, even though we, of course, didn't have a precise theory to do so. And you're led to a different picture in which we have rather um, a classical space around us, of course, eh, which can be much bigger than the observable universe, but which sort of dissolves in uncertainty on the largest scale. So it's much like what we were saying earlier about the electron. The electron doesn't have quite a position in quantum theory yeah. before we ask for its position. So if we think in the same way about the universe globally, we should be saying that the universe is a definite space, time, and configuration around us, but on the larger scales, it, it, it's rather uncertainty which dominates instead of a definite classical structure extending to infinity, as some, as some people would say. So it's a, it's a picture I, which I came to see that builds in a certain finitude. So, so quantum theory is interesting in that respect. It has always been interesting in that respect, in the sense that it's a theory of what we can know, but also a theory that sort of tells us what we can't know. Mm. And here, um, in our in our model, this is sort of playing out, yeah, at the at the level of the largest scales. By the way, this will be of interest to our listeners. Are you assuming in the background something like the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics? I'm certainly assuming an interpretation. Um, that is like many worlds in the sense that I'm trying to work with an interpretation of quantum theory that doesn't require anything external. Yeah. Right? Or any but, hidden variables for that matter. Yeah, 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 yeah. The funny thing in cosmology, though, we, we often think about uh, quantum mechanics and, and, and the many world interpretation when we think about uh, future branchings. Mm. So we make a, we prepare an experiment, the wave function splits, the observer gets correlated with one outcome, and so forth. But the thing which I found striking in cosmology is that the current state of the universe around us is already the result of a giant question asked of the wave function. Mm. And so it's sort of the, the many world interpretation in cosmology also acts a lot, or I think is important when it comes to the past. Sure. In selecting uh, this or that subset of, of, of histories. And like anything, 
like any branching in 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 in, in quantum cosmology, say, it comes with limitations. So in in a sense, you could say the multiverse. It's it's almost we're behaving as if we have access to an infinite amount of information. Whereas, of course, from an observer's perspective within the universe, there's a the extent to which our observations distill one or another branch of the wave function is is is, is finite. And 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 Stephen Strick to to so close the universe to turn time into space helps in that respect. I think this would be a great opportunity to clarify something about, you know, to, again, the person on the street who's not playing with equations, hears words and, and, and tries their best to figure out what's going on. So we hear about Feynman and his sum over histories, right? Like Feynman said, consider all possible histories of the particle or the universe, and there's a certain way of adding them, adding their contributions together to get the quantum wave function. And and Stephen and Jim Hartle used that idea intimately when they wrote down their wave function. That's different than Everett's view of many branches of the wave function, because his individual branches are supposed to be real. They're not mathematical fictions that we add up. And in some sense, they're kind of classical, right? So is that a fair distinction, the way you're thinking about it? Yes, I think so. Um, so I think it's more the Feynman kind of description that is perhaps at the heart of this theory. Um, well, let's let's get down to brass tacks. Do you believe that there really exist other universes where things are very different, other branches? That does not quite enter in our theory. Okay. Um, and that is because, in the end, as certainly certainly inspired by these holographic uh, constructions they work very much what we call top-down, so backwards in time. So they're very much anchored, so to speak. The histories that play a role in the wave function are anchored on, yeah, I would say, our observational situation around us. And so in a sense, I, my feeling is that the, the new holographic wave flooding cosmology is going to, at the very least, uh, trim the wave function of the universe down to, yeah, well, I would say, uh, a more manageable thing. <laughs> okay, but if I observe a spin that's in a superposition of spin up and spin down, and, and yeah. I, I see that it's spin up, do you think there's another version of me that saw spin down? Well, as an operational meaning, sure. <laughs> well, uh, you, you say right. sure. A lot of people think that's a radical thought to think that there's a, a version of me that saw spin down. Sure, but that branching, once you observe it, Sure, sure. I, w I, would, I would view that as an operational way of describing uh, your setup, okay. your experiment, your observation. But once, once the observation has unfolded, what happens to the other you? It's lost in uncertainty, again, I would say. And every branch that, 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 that grows out of the other you uh, will no longer be uh, contributing to this universe. Okay. So let me try out the following analogy that struck me as I was thinking about uh, your book. Okay. Yeah, so if we if we do let's let's say we do Schrodinger's cat, right? So Schrodinger puts the cat in a quantum superposition of alive and dead. And famously, if we open the box and look at the cat, we don't see the quantum superposition. We see the cat alive or the cat dead. I think that what you're saying is kind of like the following that if I had an infinite series of cats, spread out in space. I could look at one of them and it would either be alive or dead, but very, very far away, the cats could still be in a superposition. And it would be a mistake for me to think of this ensemble as just a random collection of cats alive and dead. It becomes more and more quantum as you go further away. Yeah. Uncertain, indeed. Yeah, just like the electron position. Yeah. And yeah. So, so, yeah. You're so you're saying in, that we should- indeed, indeed. We should think of cosmology like that. We can talk about our, the classical world that we see, but let's not extend this classical picture too far away. Let's leave it uncertain. Uh, that seems to me to be the lesson. And that's also at the heart of how this quantum way of thinking about it resolves the measure problem. Because it is anchored on what you just said, what we see, rather than try to get, a, to get us into the to the picture, into the cosmos, uh, a posteriori, so to speak. Yeah. 
Like, and, for instance, uh, someone with an anthropic principle would do. And is this the what you mean by the top-down approach? Yes. So say Perfect. say pretend that we didn't just say that. Tell us what the top-down approach <laughs> is. <laughs> right, right. So um, what we mean by a top-down approach is indeed that we regard the universe as we observe it around us um, as a kind of starting point for which of the many possible histories of the universe contribute to, to what we see and what we observe. And that is important because it provides you selecting those, se selecting those histories or selecting those subset of branches in the wave function then allows you to make predictions for future observations. Because that's kind of the problem with the multiverse, right? If mm. you have many different universes and you want to predict something for a future observation for the next satellite, yeah, you need some sort of criteria. And that's, that's uh, good. That was very much at a sort of, that was sort of the guideline also eh, uh, for Stephen and me. So to get, to get, we sort of had this intuition that a proper, quantum way of thinking about the universe should somehow resolve this should sort of give us a measure and give us mm. give us an unambiguous criterion for future predictions but it comes with a radical different perspective of course because we used to be able we used to think that we would one day be able to predict from first principles how the universe should be, how the universe mm. should turn out. Um, that was the kind of attitude that Hawking took in, in brief history of time, like a, a sort of transcendental theory that tells us why and how the universe is the way it is. That's how he phrased it. And he totally came, uh, he totally turned, turned 180 degrees on this point, which, which I think well, was a very interesting, um, a very interesting evolution to, to to witness in his thinking. So I want to make sure that the listeners know what we mean when we say the measure problem. Um, in a multiverse, in a very big multiverse that we do, as, as you and I agree, it would be sloppy and careless to think of it as a big classical ensemble of things, but let's think of it that way anyway. There's a lot of observers. They see a lot of different things, uh, you know, different cosmological constants, different masses of the electron or whatever. And a, a, a traditional multiverse cosmology thing to do would be to say, what is the chance that you observe the ele electron mass to be a certain number? And the problem is there's an infinite number of observers in this universe who observe it to be a certain number and also an infinite number that observe it to be a different number. And it's very hard to take infinity divided by infinity to figure out what fraction of people will see a certain thing. That's the measure problem in my mind, yeah? Yeah, I think it's one version. Uh, there's a different aspect which I think is closely related to what you say. And so you, we, are, we asked the question, faced with the multiverse, we would ask the question, what's the probability that we see this or that? Yeah. But there's this subtlety in what we mean by we. Yes. Uh, depending if you have a different de definition or a different description of what we means, what physical characteristics you associate to an observer, be it a human observer uh, or, uh, or a habitable planet or just a galaxy, depending on how you choose to define that, you're going to get a different answer. Yeah. <laughs> and so there is, it's almost not settable, settable uh, by rational arguments because right. you could turn all, you could turn a negative outcome into a positive outcome by changing what you mean by we. And so that's another version of, I think, the measure problem, a version which points very clearly to the underlying problem with the multiverse, that it is a construction, a kind of platonic construction that is out there independently of whether it is observed or not. It's out there with an independent existence from us. And that, frankly, it took many years uh, um, by the time I sort of fully realized the, the depth of the problem. The God's eye view, in other words. 
Ja, it's what Stephen calls, called indeed, and many others, I think, eh? the God's the God's eye view, um, which in, indeed, and by by 2005 or so, we were absolutely convinced that uh, we had to, yeah, um, construct cosmology in a different way from what what Stephen called a warm's eye view. Not a very good term, I think. <laughs> That's okay. You get the idea, right? <laughs> well, I, I do think I actually really like the philosophy behind it, and I, I think it's kind of a shame that Stephen famously, you know, went to rhetorical war against the philosophers because I think that there's useful. I agree. I agree. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a good point. Um, and one can wonder why that was uh, to sell books. <laughs> you think so? I. You know, he uh Maybe people more than I do. Well, I I, I I can say that people who knew about, you know, how he constructed his famous sentences about philosophy being dead and, and so forth in uh the grand design, it was very clearly to sell books. Oh, but um right. That is probably true. But my feeling is uh but I'm not sure I'm not a biographer, right? But yeah. my feeling is that the whole philosophy is dead. Thing of how King predates the grand design. He he was never a fan of philosophy. No, that that's true. But that doesn't distinguish him from plenty of other physicists, right? <laughs> like plenty of physicists uh, will. Right, but wrongly so, I think. Because I think so too, if but, you now yeah. look back on our just on the conversation we had, this issue God's eye versus let's call it Worm's eye is is foundational. Yes, because it is really about. What is it ultimately that physical theory, theory finds out about the world? Is it some sort of eternal transcendental truth? Or is physical theory, once you get the observer fully incorporated in there, um, a different beast from what we thought it was, contingent on our existence within the universe? Right. And that's, uh, for this I mean, I we I think we must admire Stephen for the for just for the simple fact that he was able to change his mind on this. Oh yeah, sure. Um, and so in the, at the end, towards the end of my life, he uh, of his life, he 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 said uh, literally, by, okay, with top down, with that new approach to cosmology, somehow we put humankind back in the center. That is a very different Stephen from the one we could read in a brief history of time. Very much, and I will. I do. I should apologize to you because all of what you do and talk about in the book is too close to things that I care about. So instead of asking you questions, I keep saying, "What about this?" <laughs> but uh, I, hopefully, you can deal with my well, question not, asking not, style. Not. So, so let me do it again. Let me let me say, "What about this?" Because yeah. I, I think that this this question of predicting what we should be like if the certain multiverse uh, were true is exactly wrongheaded. That that's the point on which I completely agree with you. Like what do you mean what we should be like? We're us. You know, we we are what we are like. Uh, I do think it's possible and you could probably say this even classically in a big fluctuating ensemble. You could ask what is the probability that your theory predicts the existence of anybody like you? And if that probability is is one, who cares if there's many more people not like you? You're you're going to be right. there in in the multiverse, right? Or in in the in the theory. That's right. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, certain probabilities we just don't care about. And Jim Hartle and Mark Shrednicki made a made a point about this with the example of Jovians. Do you know their example about the Jovians? Sure, sure. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, can yeah, you yeah. tell it to us, to the readers, to the listeners? Oh, I don't remember the details, but uh, they they. You can correct me, but their point was that um, should we expect um, in some giant ensemble of of of, of uh, inhabitants, say, should we expect to be typical? Yeah. In 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 one or another sense, um, given that all we know is that we exist. Yeah. <laughs> and so they made a big point in explaining that the mere observation of the fact that we exist is very, very different if you don't have access to other civilizations or planets or extraterrestrials from saying that we should be typical. Right. And the reason is once and is, is, is the say is the same as what we were discussing earlier. Typicality in the end always boils down to 
uh, treating certain features of our living systems or biosphere or planet or galaxy as preferred, mm. as eh, uh, the most probable. And, 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 but that is, that is, that is, that is uh, fallacious, fallacious thinking, really. So good. So I, I think that uh, we're very much on the same wavelength there. You know, you, I, I take it you would agree that there's no reason to think that you or I as individuals or human beings as a species are typical in the universe. And even, and this is the key point, and even that nature of the physical laws that we observe is the typical outcome of some grand uh, cosmic evolution. Exactly. Good. So, ni- so the, neither is the neither is the tree of life on Earth, as sketched first by Darwin, the typical outcome of that evolution. In a sense, Stephen and I pushed that same kind of thinking further down, and we are saying, well, wait a minute, maybe the physical laws as we have them are also not a typical outcome. But, and this is the crucial point, just like Darwin, just like Darwin didn't need a zillion other planets to do biological evolution on this planet, we claim we don't need a zillion other universes to study the evolution of this universe. But it comes crucially, as you point out, it comes crucially with the caveat that uh, there is no assumption of typicality. And there is no, it could have turned out differently. Yeah. There's, uh, that's, that's, and to me, the big surprise, and this is really when, when the moment that Stephen sort of told me, look, now it's time for a new book. <laughs> me, the real surprise, this is a, as a matter of giving some homework, right? Yeah. Um, was that holo, that holographic way of thinking about cosmology builds in much of that top-down reasoning because the holography in a cosmological context really flows backwards in time from data, from an observational situation in the present. The time, the past, the time dimension is in a sense the emergent dimension and it's contingent on the kind of questions you ask. And that for me was sort of the key transition point because previously much of that top-down reasoning we were uh, preaching, so to speak, remained controversial because it felt like a choice. Mm. It felt to some people like David Gross would tell would tell us, ah, but wait a minute, you're putting in the answer. So that's this typicality reasoning again, mm-hmm. right? You're putting in the answer. I'm trying to explain. I'm trying to predict the answer. And and uh, you kind of feel like mm, mm, maybe <laughs> maybe maybe he's right. That he, oh, he has a Nobel Prize and all that. You see, um, but then holography sort of solidified that top-down reasoning. Precisely because it flows backward, it works um, backwards in time, and I was very surprised by that. And I think Stephen Stephen was too. And um, so, okay, that that's when it all sort of began to click together our our picture. Well, if you want us to believe that, which is a good thing to do, you're going to have to tell us more about holography and how it goes backward in time. I, I don't know where you want to start, but what what do you mean when you're saying holography in this context? Um, okay, so we want to talk a bit about holography. Yeah, you wrote a book. It's your yeah. job. Yeah. <laughs> um, so holography has been, let's face it, holography has been the talk of the town in theoretical physics for 25 years, right? Yeah. But of course, it's true. It's been mostly practiced in highly idealized, abstract, non-realistic uh, mathematical situations universes that have nothing to do with ours. But there's a general lesson behind holography, which is, I think it's been the way which we're finding out in which quantum theory and gravity can finally work together more or less harmoniously. And the way this works is that um, one appears to be the hologram of the other. The uh, clearest example, perhaps, is is the case of a black hole. Uh, we think about a black hole. We've seen images of a black hole. Uh, that's all very nice. And a black hole is something very gravitational, right? It uh, space time is curved. Uh, 
highly curved. Einstein says there is a there is a surface, there is a horizon, uh, and inside the horizon, inside the black hole, space time really yeah, crumbles, comes to an end. Um, so that's the gravitational description of a black hole. But then when you start thinking about a black hole from a quantum perspective, you begin to discover, going back to the work of Bekenstein and Hawking and many others, that, well, maybe all there is to know about a black hole is, in fact, uh, located in bits of information that are living in the, on the horizon surface, that are living on the surface. So if you start reasoning about a black hole that way, you might arrive at the conclusion that the inside of a black hole <laughs> doesn't really exist or isn't or is in a sense yeah not not quite there is some sort of emergent emergent phenomenon which you may not need if you want to ask physical questions you could ask physical questions from a quantum perspective and just only talk about the horizon or little thick the horizon so I think that's much of the more motivation or inspiration for maybe there is a, a fully quantum way of thinking about the universe, about space and time, is in a sense holographic, in the sense that there is one dimension, in the case of a black hole, the interior dimension, mm -hmm. that is emergent, that mm. is not quite fundamental. And now you begin to think, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, the Big Bang is another problematic thing, uh, just like black holes, space-time crumbles, um, what dimension in cosmology could be the one that is holographically projected, that is sort of encoded in a lower-dimensional screen-like thing, uh, just like a hologram? Well, as we discussed, in cosmology, it is very much the dimension of time, which is the problematic one. Mm -hmm. It's the one that has an origin. It's the one that disappears with the Big Bang. It's the one that causes us a headache. And the development of those holographic ideas in theoretical physics indeed suggests that it is the dimension of time in a cosmological context that can be holographically encoded in a, yeah, a hologram. So we start with a moment of time or you know, some 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 spatial description of the universe and then we kind of do holographic tricks to understand how that could be projected into time evolution i'm just stringing words together yeah. like chat gpt here you can you can fix that <laughs> <laughs> uh, right right the way i see it is that there is okay i i, I want to say two things here First of all, this holographic way of thinking about reality is completely useless in normal circumstances, right? Today, uh, here around you, around me, around everywhere, there is time and there is space and, and, and we can work with that. Yeah. But where holography becomes important, I think, is where Einstein's theory, I, the, where the description of reality in terms of space and time that we experience, where that description doesn't hold. So inside black holes and at the Big Bang, my feeling is that in those extreme regions of the universe, the more fundamental holographic quantum nature rises to the forefront. And, it, and, and, and so what I mean by that is that in those extreme regions of the universe, one of the familiar dimen dimensions disappears. So in the case of the black hole, it's the interior of the black hole. In the case of the universe, if we go, if we trace the history of the universe backwards, it's all fine. But at some point, the bending of time becomes so strong. And you think what holography is telling us is that, well, in fact, the dimension doesn't reach further. The holographic way of saying the same thing would be that the hologram doesn't quite encode the information to push history further backwards. And so the Big Bang in holographic way of thinking about the universe becomes almost like it becomes almost like an epistemic horizon. Okay. A region, region where you can't yeah, you run out of bits almost literally. That's kind of uh where it stands. Of course it has to be this is a grand new hypothesis. It has yeah, to be developed in so many ways. <laughs> but you sort of get a gist, right? 
Yeah, no, I do. And so maybe a motto might be classically, we would say, if we kept going backward in the history of the universe, time would end because we hit the Big Bang singularity. And what you're saying is time kind of ceases to be a thing. <laughs> it's not that it ends, but it ceases to be a useful way of talking about the universe. Yeah, I think indeed. Um, right, right. Gradually, in a, maybe. Way, in a way, what we have been trying to do in, in cosmology ever since the discovery of the Big Bang is to let time, when we go backwards, disappear in a controlled fashion. Sure. And that's essentially, that has essentially been the goal. Um, and of course, it's kind of interesting to look back on this because this is what the singularity theorems in the 60s tell us to do. Find mm -hmm. a better way to find, mm -hmm. find a better way to, to let time disappear into the Big Bang so that physics doesn't break down. And of course, these ideas about the multiverse or about pre-Big Bang cosmologies, they're sort of ideas that all go in the direction, well, maybe the Big Bang wasn't really the origin. Maybe there is something, maybe we can just push through. Yeah. Do physics as we as we normally do it. But it's kind of interesting that this hypothesis that I developed with Hawking is very different. It's taking the idea of an origin very seriously. In fact, even more seriously than 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 the early Hawking would, would, would have done it, in the sense that if you let the time dimension disappear, it's it's as if the laws of physics disappear. And so it's it's really sort of placing that notion of an origin very central in our thinking about the early universe. And in that sense, I think we can now begin to see clearer the difference between this hypothesis and 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 other hypotheses that 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 evoke uh, an evolution before the Big Bang and all that. Well, let me consider two different cosmological scenarios. One is one much like we think is real. In other words, we have observers like us today, and we trace back 14 billion years, and there was a Big Bang. And that Big Bang, by the way, was a very low entropy special condition, as Roger Penrose and others have, have pointed out. Another one might be there's sort of a galaxy, kind of like the Milky Way and people like us, but the whole background space-time is otherwise empty. So there's no Big Bang. There's just a weird random fluctuation in which all the particles came together to make the our galaxy and then they'll disperse in the future and, and there's no beginning to end of time. Does okay. your theory explain why our universe looks like the former rather than the latter? Right. I'm writing a paper on that. Good. Yeah. Hurry up. <laughs> what are you um, doing being on podcasts when you should be writing your paper, Thomas? <laughs> okay. Um... My claim is the following, that if you specify in sufficient detail the local galactic uh, configuration that you sketched, by, by, by which I mean really the actual configuration, so you mm -hmm. specify enough data, yeah. then you will see a switch. I'm revealing really the latest research here. You feel, you feel a switch in from uh, from your second scenario to your first scenario. So if you only sort of loosely say, well, I've got some sort of Milky Way, I'm not very much uh, interested in its precise description, then you might well favor an empty universe without anything else. But if you begin to describe that observation situation, the fact that uh, in, in sufficient detail, then at some point it'll become... Uh, you will see a phase transition, you will see a shift towards the universe like we actually observe it. Okay, I will go on the record as saying that would be great, and I don't believe you. <laughs> but we can talk about that. You should be skeptical. I am skeptical. I think that even I could I could I would claim that you can specify to whatever level of detail you want uh, the the world around us to uh, you know, a uh, hundred thousand parsecs in every direction, surrounded by vacuum, and everything is perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, wait. What is the, what is the statement then? The statement is uh, that it doesn't matter how 
carefully I specify my current observations here in the Big Bang. I can always embed them in a universe. Sorry, here in the Milky Way. My sorry, my mistake. I can always uh, embed uh, them very easily in the universe without a Big Bang at all. And I, I suspect strongly, and though I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe this is what you can convince me of. But I suspect strongly that in in most known principled ways of comparing the likelihood of those two possibilities, the, the empty universe is going to come out more likely. Yeah. yeah. So indeed, uh, what I'm going to reveal uh, is indeed, of course, a different way to compare these likelihoods. Mm. Good. I look forward to seeing that. But okay. Yeah, good, yeah. Um, I guess the last loose end here, this has, been, this has been excellent. Thank you very much for explaining a lot of, of this modern research to us. I just want to get straight one last time the comparison to the multiverse story. So if I understand what you're saying, which I think I, I mostly do, I can kind of conditionalize on here I am, here's the Big Bang, here's what I observe, and then I use your theory to uh, reconstruct the past and the future of the universe. Could, so yeah. Could I have conditionalized on completely different kinds of people and completely different laws of physics and things like that and told a similar story all still within your framework? Oh, uh, it, yes, yes, sure, sure. You could do a thought experiment and conditionalize, in fact, we do many of those thought experiments in theory, and conditionalize or start, so to speak, from an entirely different configuration, Yeah, and you'd get a different uh, past and future. Good. All of these pasts and futures are limited, just like we discussed as. So good, so just to, if I'm just trying to get it right, so I keep repeating. Um, so what you're saying is that once I say who I am, the classical world around me is is finite. It's limited because it sort of dissolves into quantum uncertainty if I go too far. But yeah. I can think of it as an ensemble of many different patchwork classical realities, all of which are there in the wave function of the universe. Good. This is his last point. I am yeah. no longer convinced of. Okay. Good. That all these different that all these different classical worlds fit in one grand wave function. That's indeed the. Uh, the, the heart of that top-down approach taken taken fully. Um, and the evidence we have for this, and this is a crucial point, I think, yes, the evidence we have for this is that they're not all there in one grand wave function uh, when we think uh, holographically about this. Holograph hol holography really sort of, yeah, it's kind of interesting. It brings in this observational perspective with, in the theory, but at the same time, it, it then also limits the range of that wave function that we've been talking about. It limits the range mm. of different realities mm -hmm. that the wave function encompasses. Now, of course, we are talking really cutting edge stuff, right? But <laughs> you're absolutely right. Is there a grand overarching wave function encompassing all possible holographic theories? Or is there a limitation? on the reach of physical theory that is contingent on, say, a boundary configuration or an observational configuration. Yeah. And we don't know yet. Still work to be done. That remains to be seen. Yes, sure, sure. It's good sure. that not all the questions are yet answered because that leaves something for you to say in your next book, <laughs> 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 which I predict is going to come out eventually. So, Thomas Hartog, thanks very yeah. much for being on the Mindscape podcast. Thank you so much, Sean. Lovely.